so, uh, first of all, uh, please uh, permit me to confirm that all the members and persons anticipated are present and can hear me. So members, when I call your name, uh, please respond in the affirmative. So Grant Gibeon. I'm here. Uh, Shane Blundell. Here. John Ellis. Carolyn White. Mary Margaret Franklemont. I see you and hear you. Uh, Arif Padaria. I'm here. Jonathan Wallach. Uh, Charles Fuskett, I'm here. Brian Beck. Brian Beck. He's here. They're muted. What did they say? He's on mute. <laughs> Brian, you're on mute. I'm asking. Did, did, did I know. I was trying to click it. I couldn't find it. <laughs> Peter Howard. Here. Shailene Pokras. Daryl Harmer. Here. John Dice. Alan Jones. Here. William Keller. Here. Al Tosti. Here. George Koser. Here. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carmen. Here. David McKenna. And you didn't mention. Uh, I'm here with Judith. You, you didn't call Annie LaCourt. <laughs> oh, you're right. I didn't call Annie LaCourt. Annie LaCourt. I'm here. Sorry, Annie. It's okay. Small print on my list. <laughs> Did John Ellis answer? No. Did uh, Jonathan Wallach answer? No. No? Okay. Carol, Carolyn White, and, uh, she didn't answer either. Oh, thank you. So uh, let me continue, please, with the protocol with respect to remote meetings. Um, Liz Diggins, are, are you present? I am. Um, and um, we anticipate as speakers, uh, Adam Chapdelaine and Sandy Pooler. I don't know if they are present yet. Not yet. <clears throat> so uh, the open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted in the agenda material for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to e Elizabeth Diggins at uh, ediggins at town.arlington.ma.us.com. For this meeting, the Arlington Finance Committee is con uh, convening by video via Zoom uh, application as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference accordingly. Please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public's encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now going to be turning to the first item of the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct over business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda, and after they conclude their remarks, we'll go down the line of members inviting each by name. Uh, to provide any comment, questions, or motions, or ask if anyone has any particular question they wish to uh, ask. Please hold uh, any comments until your name is called or you are recognized. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. And I would suggest that we all uh, try to follow that and take a, take a look at doing that uh, as I speak. 
please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair leads, yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage uh, in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Thank you. So the first uh, item, let's, let me first, uh, this, you've all received a copy of the agenda, I believe. Um, so, and we have gone through the open meeting protocol and um, roll call. Uh, I would just like to make a couple of comments, thanking uh, members of the committee for the uh, efforts and work they've put in uh, so far this year. Uh, Christine, Daryl, and John uh, did a fantastic job on the Arlington Police Department report. We'll refer to that a little bit later in the meeting. Um, Annie and Al Jones and Daryl, George Koser and Grant are working on the information systems working group. And um, we've all, I hope, been through the initial training on that. And uh, Annie will be giving us a overview presentation later today. Arif uh, was critical with in helping uh, Liz and I on recruiting earlier in the year. And as you know, uh, Jonathan Wallach has signed up and has been actively participating as our uh, delegate to the Capital Planning Committee. Uh, in preparation for the town meeting, uh, Al Tosti did a fantastic job uh, training us all on the complex matter of the Arlington Housing Trust Fund. And Dean's been following uh, assiduously on the Arlington Public Schools budget and working as a de facto member of the uh, APS budget subcommittee. Uh, Christine and Al uh, have joined me on the Long Range Planning Committee. And of course, um, Liz Diggins is involved in all of these things and I thank her for her efforts. Um, any, anyone who would like to make any other comments on that, please uh, feel free to announce your intentions. Silence, okay. Mm. That's what happens when you shut the, um, uh, you shut the microphones down. So uh, the next item of the minutes, uh, the minutes of the, was it, um, what was the date on the minutes, uh, Peter? 11-23. Yes, thank you. So the minutes of 11-23 have been distributed. Uh, are there any comments uh, anyone wants to make on those minutes? Any edits? Okay, uh, in that case, a motion to approve the minutes is in order. Al Tafsi? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, please, um, by acclamations, say aye. 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 Any objections? The minutes of the meeting are approved. Uh, and Peter, would you uh, please note that Shailene has uh, joined us? Hi, Thank Shailene. You. We'll, we'll go. Hi, sorry, I was stuck in the waiting room, possibly in the wrong Zoom meeting. I'm here now. Good to see that, all of that you. That has the, the high technology virtual waiting room, exactly. And um, Charlie, I've also and, joined. And Jonathan has joined. Jonathan Wallach has joined us as well. Okay. Also, John Diced. And John Diced. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, <clears throat> and, and uh, Peter, for the record, uh, I noted. I note that Julie Wayman. Don Selter, Sandy Pooler, anybody else? I've also joined the uh, the meeting. Makaya Healy as well. I have notes here, um, Pete, that I'm um, having on the visitor sign-in sheet. Okay. We can compare on those two. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so. Sandy. Uh, are we expecting Adam? He's in. He's in. Okay, good. Then we can move to the uh, next item of the agenda. <clears throat> so um, tonight, the first uh, finance committee meeting of 2021. I'm pleased to introduce uh, town manager Adam Chapdelaine and deputy town manager and finance director Sandy Pooler. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I would mention that despite the various eruptions of political acrimony in the last uh, years uh, that have been popping up around the country and in our society, there's general consensus that Arlington is a pretty well-run town. Our schools are good, services are reliably provided. Uh, I recall at one long time, 
town manager said uh, snow re removal and trash collection are the only two services that count. I'm not sure that's sure, true, but um, our community safety is well preserved and health and human services are delivered to citizens in need, whether they be youth, struggling adults, veterans, or seniors. This state of affairs arise from many sources, the school committee, the select board, the town meeting, other organizations, but it's in no small part due to the efforts of our town manager and deputy town manager. And I also think from our finance committee viewpoint that they have worked hard to develop a strong financial management team within town government. With their presentation tonight, uh, they'll set the tone for the months and years ahead within the envelope of our many uh, fiscal constraints. I'm sure we'll benefit from the things they can tell us, but I'd also like to remind you members of the finance committee in the words of Al Tosti, tonight you have the town manager and the deputy town manager in your grasp. And you should take advantage of this to learn as much as you can about the condition of the town. So um, with those brief remarks, um, I would be pleased to turn the meeting over to uh, Adam Chapdelaine and his team. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, kind remarks, and I, I suppose I'll take grasp better than clutches. It sounds slightly less ominous. Uh, we're also joined tonight uh, by Julie Wayman, the management analyst in, uh, in my office, uh, who's going to play a role in tonight's presentation as well. So if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, what I'd like is for Sandy to begin with a brief update on where we stand in this current fiscal year, in FY21. Uh, I'll then walk through uh, FY22 and a little bit about our longer term outlook. And then I'll ask Julie to talk to the committee about uh, the current state of the capital plan and capital budget. Uh, is that acceptable, Mr. Chairman? That's, please, please go right ahead. Great. So Sandy, that's, uh, why don't you kick it off? <coughs> and then either Charlie or Liz, whoever's controlling, if somebody could make me a co-host so I could share some things on the screen, that would be terrific. Liz, I think you'll have to do that. I don't, I'm not uh, quite there. Uh, you should have sharing capabilities, Sandy, do you not? Um, let me find out. Thank you, Annie. Uh, oh, I suppose you can see that, yes? Yes. Oh, well, magic. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, so one of the things we've been doing over the last uh, year and a half or so, uh, two years maybe now, is to do a quarterly financial report, uh, which has been emailed to the committee members, looking at our revenue and expenditures at this point in the year. Um, it is an important report for us, uh, I think internally, just to keep track of things. I often find as I put the numbers together to for this, I send an email to a department or uh, to the treasurer, to the comptroller, just asking about something. And, and uh, not very often, but often enough, you find that something got missed somewhere or, or put in the wrong place. Um, as I said, that is the exception to the rule. Uh, and what I wanted to talk about tonight was just where we stand in FY21 which I think will also put some context into the remarks that Adam is gonna give about how we've been putting together the FY22 budget. Um, you all have, were emailed the report. Um, this slide just summarizes um, essentially where we stand on each of our funds. So uh, on the revenue side, the general fund has collected 49% of its budgeted revenue. Um, that is pretty much to be expected uh, this time of year since most of our, our larger source of revenue is taxes. And then the second half of the year, once we have our actual tax bills instead of our estimated tax bills, um, those come in a little higher than the first part of the year. So we're tracking fine. We are at, spent 69% of our general fund revenue um, Again, I'm not worried about that because we um, certainly spend some things ahead of time, i.e. there's some costs that we incur, uh, whether it's um, our IT contracts or paying um, our fees to the 
on our, our allotment to the retirement fund uh, and so forth that, uh, that come due upfront. So uh, I think we are generally on target there. The water and sewer fund is having a good year, uh, both because uh, the select board has been uh, a little earlier uh, this year than in the past about raising fees so that they take effect as of uh, the July 1st bills. Um, and so revenue is ahead uh, and uh, our expenses are at the same point. Although again, some of that is has to do with certain spending that happens earlier in the year, such as debt payments and so forth. Uh, we also have had a good year in revenue because this summer was a drought. So we've been selling more water than we anticipated. So I think the water and sewer fund is in good shape. Uh, AYCC has uh, collected only 37% of its revenue to date that, and spent 67. Um, that is largely because of the delay in the, fe in the state budget being passed. Since it didn't get passed until October, the state uh, was not able to pay their share of the revenues that are due to AYCC. Um, they haven't come in for the fall really yet. Um, we're told that they are coming in soon. So I expect by the third quarter, we will see that all caught up. Council on Aging Transportation uh, has collected 12% of its revenue and spent 35% of uh, its expenses. Uh, that is all mostly because the numbers are small and uh, there hasn't been much COA transportation this year because the senior center has been shut down. Uh, again, we've been looking at that and where the numbers are coming in. And uh, I think overall that's gonna be fine by the end of the year. The one fund that worries me now is the RINC. Um, it's collected only 27% of its revenue while it spent 61%. It has had a series of cancellations uh, and other changes to its ability to, um, to run uh, because of COVID that have held it back um, from uh, collecting sufficient revenues. I've been talking with Joe Connolly about this a lot and um, we are looking at perhaps transferring certain costs uh, that are incurred in the rink now, such as some of the staff time over to the recreation fund um, because people just frankly have been working more uh, on the recreation side. On the recreation side, we've collected only 17% of revenue, but uh, we have um, spent 27% of our expenses. Uh, we do anticipate revenue is gonna pick up in the spring and uh, at the end of the spring where we collect the number of fees for programs that occur in the summer but come into the fund in, in the spring. So there's always a little bit of a, a time lag that way. Um, and um, there is a sufficient fund balance in that fund uh, that I think they can make up some of the, the deficit by reallocating some of the rinks expenses in there too. Um, so this is a very 50,000 foot level uh, look at where we stand. Overall, I think we're doing well. I did wanna just, focus in on some of our local receipts. Um, anything that's in pink here means it's less than 50% collected during the year. Um, so some things are uh, way low, like even though motor vehicle excise is in pink because it's in pink most of the year, it's because we, sent, we get the, our files from the registry in February and we collect the vast bulk of that in February. So uh, it's, on par with where things have been in other years. Our meals tax and hotel tax are way above our estimates, but our estimates are very, oops, excuse me, our estimates are very low this year. These used to be $425,000 each, and now they're 50 and $60,000 respectively. So even though we're collecting more uh, than we budgeted, we're still gonna be about $350,000 short from what we, would have expected in a normal year. Um, other things are sort of running ahead and behind. I'm not too worried about them. Um, it is interesting to note that cemetery revenue is, is running behind uh, this year and running behind other years. I think that's just because fewer people have actually had burial ceremonies. Uh, so it, that is a COVID impact. 
um, our licenses and permit revenue have been coming in nicely. So there's still a lot of activity going out, out there. And that is uh, after motor vehicle excise, our largest source. And our investment income is uh, already met its year to date. I just wanted to show you this last slide uh, to look at where we stand relative to every uh, other year, going back to 2012, uh, six months through the year. As you can see, 2018 was our peak year for revenue. We've had uh, slight declines every year. And certainly this year to date, uh, we're about $700,000 below where we were last year and about a million dollars below where our peak is. Um, I, again, I think we will meet our revenue forecast, but we will not top what we've collected in prior years. And we're hoping that in the future, uh, we can get past this. Um, it does uh, bolster the decisions that we made for the FY21 budget to lower our revenue estimates. Uh, we did that in conjunction with uh, the Long Range Planning Committee and, and members of, of this committee. Um, so I think that has been a good decision for us. Um, and uh, we do continue to, to monitor these things. Um, I will answer any questions if people have them. Otherwise, I'm happy at this point to turn things over to Adam to talk about his budget or whatever you'd like, Mr. Chair. Are there any questions for Sandy? Okay, Adam, please go right ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sandy. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give an overview of the FY22 proposal and again, some of the context that went into the thinking in the formation of the budget proposal. So, so some of you have probably heard me say this uh, and, you, and you've likely read it in the budget message, but this environment that we're operating in is probably one of the most uncertain, if not the most uncertain budgeting environments that we've been in in a, in a very long time. Uh, uncertainty about what state aid might be, even though we now have the uh, governor's numbers. Uncertainty about what the economy will actually look like in FY22 and beyond based on current pace of vaccination, current rate of transmission of the virus. Uh, th there's, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's even deeper level uncertainty with what, uh, what we'll see for school enrollment next year. As I'm sure many of you know, enrollment really dropped this year in the school department and though we expect it will rebound to some degree. Understanding what that will be is another layer of the uncertainty. So I, I put that out there as context uh, for why this budget is a little bit different than years past in that we're making recommendations that we fully expect will be discussed over the course of this spring with the finance committee uh, as we lead up to town meeting, as we learn more from legislative budgets, as we learn more from what might come from federal relief. We won't really learn more about what school enrollment will be like, uh, but we might learn some more things about the school budget that will help influence what ultimately is recommended to town meeting in the spring. So uh, with that, I, I guess I'll start with the town side of the budget. And I'll say that almost entirely the town side of the budget, the town departments that have been presented to, to you represent a level service budget. There's really only two areas of new investment uh, that have been included. And one is a carryover from uh, this fiscal year. And, and one is a continued investment uh, in an area of importance that we've uh, put priority on. The, the first area that we've continued a current investment is in public health. So this fiscal year using federal CARES Act money, we created two health compliance officer positions to assist with Contact, tracings and contact tracing and other efforts uh, in regards to pandemic response and management in the public health department. Uh, CARES Act funding is available now through the end of this calendar year through December 31st. So we're gonna keep those positions on and CARES Act funded through the remainder of this calendar year. But the budget before you for FY22 proposes keeping them on for the balance of that fiscal year. Uh, we're doing that because we think it's prudent to make sure that we have the resources in place to get through uh, this pandemic. Again, I'm very hopeful that um, we're, we're all vaccinated and out of this much 
sooner than that, but we, we, we want to ensure we have the resources dedicated um, to, to be sure that we have uh, whatever we need in place uh, in case this all takes longer than what we're currently projecting. Uh, the other additional investment in the town budget uh, is uh, training money for our diversity, equity, and inclusion division. So you may recall that uh, two or one fiscal year ago, we created a diversity, equity, inclusion coordinator position. Since then, we've elevated that position to uh, a director's position and pulled it out as a distinct division within Health and Human Services, uh, and also added administrative support uh, for that position. So in FY22, we're proposing that director's position, the administrative position that was added within this fiscal year, as well as training dollars uh, that can be dedicated directly to the diversity, equity, and inclusion function. Uh, but again, overall, uh, outside of those two areas I just mentioned, uh, the budget really is a level services budget. Where there are increases, it's directly related to increases in the cost of delivering services as they currently are. Moving from town budgets, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the school budget. Uh, school budgets, uh, well, I'm sorry, let me, let me dial back one, <laughs> one second. Uh, one instance is of, of us doing some things a little bit differently and the town budget is we did list four positions that if revenues were better than what we're currently projecting that we would consider asking for. They're outlined in the budget message. Uh, there's a library position, an inspectional services position, a position related to public records in the town manager's office, and a position related to um, permitting in the engineering division. I'll say tonight, um, given what we've seen from the governor's budget, I don't think we will be asking for those positions, uh, but they are currently listed uh, in the budget book. And, and if things did develop much more positively, uh, I might want to ask the Finance Committee to consider a further conversation. But right now, again, given, um, given the governor's budget, I, I don't think that's something we'll be asking for. So moving to the school budget, I've already mentioned the uncertainty about, uh, about enrollment. And the uncertainty about enrollment really colors a lot of the conversation around school funding. So working with uh, Chairman Foskett, Mr. Carmen, Ms. Deschler, uh, and the Long Range Planning Committee, as well as Sandy, we, we came up collectively with a framework of how to think about school funding, sort of a four-part framework. The first part of the framework was looking at the general education spending uh, for, the, for this current fiscal year and figuring out if um, potential surpluses that uh, could be present within this current fiscal year school department budget based on the lower amount of students being enrolled this year could be turned back to the general fund to help the general fund going forward. Additionally, wanting to learn more about if there are surpluses currently occurring in the FY21 budget, what do they mean for ongoing school budget needs in FY22 and beyond? That is an ongoing effort. Uh, I know Dean Carmen is really leading that effort, working with the school budget subcommittee. Uh, and I know Sandy's working closely with Mike Mason, the school CFO. Uh, I guess but that, I, there's not much more to say about that than that's an ongoing effort, but it's part of this framework of understanding whether or not there may or may not be surpluses within this current fiscal year budget and being able to access them appropriately to benefit the general fund. The next piece of the framework was assessing and analyzing special education spending. As I'm sure most of you know, over time, uh, we've committed to growing special education spending at 7% a year, because historically that is tracked with what actual special education costs have been. Uh, not 7% every year, but on average over a five or 10 year look back. Uh, at the request of Chairman Foskett, he suggested we really take a look at how special education costs were matching up with special education budgets. And Sandy working with Mike Mason has done a great deal of that work and seen that costs are very closely aligned with budgets. And it doesn't seem to be, the data we've seen so far doesn't seem to be suggesting there are major changes to be made there, um, though those conversations will continue uh, throughout this spring as well. The third piece of the framework was looking at the school committee's a five-year strategic plan that was part of the override commitments that the select board voted two years ago. So you may recall as part of the override, it was committed that we would fund um, 600,000, 600,000, 
800,000 and 800,000 in the four fiscal years of the override plan or the long range plan. In the first year that 600,000 was met, the second year being this current fiscal year, because of uncertainties last spring uh, about what the school year would look like and what the budget year would look like, we funded 240,000, uh, excuse me, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my numbers backwards, Sandy. What did we fund last year? 140, 140, 140. thank you. Thank you. Um, 140,000 last year. Um, going forward, I know myself and Sandy agreed and Chair Foskett and others agreed that making sure we maintain the overrides commitments to funding that strategic plan uh, for the schools would be important. So we have rolled in um, $230,000 in FY22 and a planned additional $230,000 in FY23 to go on top of what have been the previously planned 800,000 so that by the end of the four year plan, the schools would be made whole in terms of what they had expected to receive for strategic plan funding. Uh, I've had discussions with the superintendent about that uh, and she seems to, to view that favorably uh, in terms of how they could actually practically implement and spend, implement the plan and spend that money. The final piece of the framework for the schools, which I think is the most impactful, is how to treat the growth factor. So again, as you know, for I think it's the past eight years now, maybe seven years, we have agreed to a formula with the schools where utilizing school enrollment growth from the current year, we would take that number and multiply it by some percentage of per pupil expenditures to come up with what we call the growth factor. And that would be additional money added to the school budget allocation uh, to recognize enrollment growth. When that formula was first put in place, it was 25% of per pupil expenditures as certified by the state's Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Several years later, it was increased to 35% of that figure. And then as part of this override plan, it was increased to 50% of that PPE figure. Now this year, unlike any other year, um, not only did the schools not see the growth they had projected, but they went down. So we, again, have an expectation that students will come back, but we really don't know how many will come back uh, in the fall. So what we're proposing is holding back the growth factor amount that had been planned for FY22 in the long range plan and putting it into a special finance committee reserve such that when enrollment is known in the fall, the school department can come back to the finance committee to request funds that correspond with what their actual enrollment is. Uh, it's, a, it's a new and I think somewhat unique way of looking at things, but I think, um, but I, but I think it meets the, meets the time and meets the challenge of what we're seeing. So again, that, that's the four part framework, looking at general, edu uh, general education costs now, special education costs, investing in the strategic plan, and then trying to prudently budget for, but not automatically allocate uh, growth factor until we know what the enrollment is for next year. So overall, uh, this all leads to an FY24, uh, what is a pretty still significant deficit. Um, when the override was passed um, two years ago, uh, we did understand that in FY24, there would likely be quite a large deficit and the projected deficit now is actually less than what we projected it to be when the override passed. Um, however, what this pandemic and the corresponding economic impacts have really done is take out any of the benefits that we would have expected to receive via our conservative revenue budgeting. So as Sandy had highlighted in his year-to-day budget reports, we're not collecting nearly as much in local receipts as we would have been otherwise without the impact of this pandemic. So we're, we're not gonna see the type of free cash growth uh, or excess collections as we've seen in years past that would have put us in a position to possibly con you know, continue to reduce that override or that deficit in FY24. So we are looking at FY22 and 23, understanding that there's likely to be hard decisions to be made within the next two fiscal years. Uh, but with all of the uncertainty being balanced and with the knowledge of decisions to come for FY24, we do think the FY22 budget as proposed um, is a prudent balance of all those matters or of all those items. So I guess I'll stop there. And Charlie, do, do you wanna take 
questions on FY22 before we go to capital or do you want to roll into capital first? I think, um, why don't we pause for questions, um, Adam, because I think the, uh, especially the issues uh, that you outlined with respect to approaching the school department budget have a, um, you know, a rather dramatic effect. And, um, and, and you might comment on what is your feeling as to the size of the override required in uh, fiscal uh, 24? Sure, so I'll, I'll start with that. If, if nothing was to change, and if you look, if you look at the long-range plan, um, it goes out FY 24, 25, 26. Just to close those three years, um, again, if, if nothing was to change, you'd be talking about an override in the amount somewhere between 13, 14, 15 million dollars, which um, would be tremendously larger than overrides that have been passed historically in Arlington or, frankly, anywhere in the state. Uh, so I think that that. Putting it like that, Charlie, it really helps uh, paint the picture of the significance of the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So let me ask, um, are there, is there anyone in the committee that has any questions for, um, for Adam on the, the um, town or school budgets as outlined here? Yes, Jonathan, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Adam, um, in terms of the money that you're recommending, the enrollment growth money that you're recommending go into the reserve fund. Um, so if I understand what you're saying, that if actual enrollment growth in 22 is, uh, if, if there is act, some actual enrollment growth, we're going to apply some of those reserve funds to fund the enrollment growth in 22? So to be very clear, what we're saying is if enrollment rebounds to last year's level and then beyond, then we would say, I, I mean, it's what I'm saying ultimately would be the finance committee's decision if it went forward. Um, we, we would be saying then the school committee could come and access those funds. So not, not enrollment growth from today's enrollment, but enrollment growth beyond sort of what we would call the status quo of last year. I understand. And just to follow up on that, if let's assume that we just, the rebound is just gets us back to last year's enrollment. Um, so, and that money continues to sit in the reserve fund, would it then be applied to, uh, you know, 23 or 24s in, in enrollment growth in excess of the status quo, or what, how do you, what do you, how do you foresee those funds being utilized? So from a mechanical perspective, if the funds were appropriated into the finance committee reserve fund in FY22 and unutilized, they would roll back in at the end of the fiscal year into the general fund, okay. which would then become part of the town certified free cash. So then the FY23 budget would be, you know, we, we would have all these same conversations again about what the FY23 budget should look like. And, and those funds rolling back into the general fund would be very helpful, right, to the overall conversation. But you can't, it's, they're not directly tied together because of the accounting rules. Very good. And, and the amount that you are recommending going to the reserve fund, um, what en enrollment growth does that assume? over and above rebounding to past. Sandy, it's based on the 150 student figure, is that correct? Yes, originally it was thought there would be an additional 150 students this year and adding um, about a, mil a little over a million dollars into the reserve fund. And um, how many students do we need to get back to get us back to where we were? 287. We lost 287 this year uh, from where we were last year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Of course, How are you? Yeah, hi. So this pertains not only to the conversation that is about the school system, but in general, um, it's been a tough year, as we all know, 2020. A lot of us run companies and are deeply embedded in the ecosystem and have had to lay off a number of people, whether in our companies and so forth. 
So my question is in terms of um, not only this uh, school committee or the school funding, but overall, have you had any cutbacks? Do you foresee any cutbacks? And if not, why not? Uh, so could you just comment on that, please? So we haven't proposed any cutbacks, but historically uh, for many years and, and until today, we try to, when we, whenever we sense or see financial concern, we hold positions vacant uh, such that if cuts became necessary, we would be able to consider cutting vacant positions rather than laying people off. Uh, I think the town's had a good track record even long before I uh, worked here in trying to avoid layoffs uh, based on both the, the personal toll of them as well as the financial toll of laying somebody off and still being responsible for unemployment payments and health insurance payments for a significant amount of time. Well, I, have a, I have a different tack to that, right? I mean, being responsible is one thing. The country has seen a significant number of layoffs. We are running, you're running a company effectively, right, Adam? So yes, I feel badly about having to lay off five or seven of my own company folks. And that is understandable. But, you know, in order to keep the enterprise alive, in order to keep the ecosystem that I'm running and building alive, I have to take that hard hit. So the question I'm asking is in our town, we all have also faced the same economic hardships. All of us have. Effectively, this should somehow translate into the ecosystem because the yeah, school enrollments are down. Effectively services, productivity, all of that is I can guarantee you is down. Somehow or the other you can calibrate it you can see that less services were being used. We are all been home. We haven't gone anywhere. We haven't done many things. So for that, if I have five people, again, I'm just being theoretical a bit here, but I'm trying to get to the core of the matter. Um, and if I've got five people working at a certain job serving 100 folks in my town, and now those 100 folks don't need those services in that given year, do I need those five people and paying their salary? So reducing the load there effectively is something that I would think about doing, even though I would feel heartache about not having jobs for those five people. So again, I'm trying to get to that matter more than anything else, because here we're talking about an overarching budget and constraints. I'm not hearing specifically anything about tightening the belt here. So frankly, uh, I realize this is a governmental in institution. But at the same time, I, I want to be a responsible citizen as well as uh, you know, bound by economics. So could you comment on that angle, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I guess I'd say a few things. Um, one, I, I honestly can't think of what service has been less strained through the pandemic from the town point of view than it was prior. Um, I'd be happy to engage in a conversation, but when I think about where our staff are, uh, is you know staff is predominantly in public works, fire, and police, and workload through the pandemic has not gone down in those three departments. In fact, in some instances, it's gone up. Um, so I, I guess to some degree, I don't fully accept the premise that workload has been down in the face of the pandemic. Uh, but that said, I still acknowledge that budgetary realities sometimes have to come up against I'll ask other, I'll ask it a different way, Adam. Uh, sorry to keep pushing on this, but it's an important component for me uh, to understand. Um, so we've not laid off people necessarily first in our company. We took pay cuts. We took pay cuts in the management team, which I'm part of. We took significant pay cuts percentage wise. And then in the, in the teams and the staff, we took lesser so percentages. What are you doing towards that, uh, it, to that end? Because ultimately it impacts the budget and the longevity of this town and the economics. So again, I'm not hearing or seeing any of that. Reflection. So let me, let me interrupt for a second, Arif. Uh, I think as opposed to asking questions, you're, you're becoming somewhat um, uh, argumentative and uh, debating an issue. And I think we're really trying to get uh, information from the town uh, town manager here. But the um, I think the a partial answer to your question is something that um, Adam just referred to a few minutes ago when he said that the, um, the, the need, the future need for an override is gonna be in the 13 million to $15 million range just to cover a few years. That's, that's actually the governor 
on our expenditure levels. And, and it's up to the town management and the finance committee, the long range planning committee to come to a consensus on how much that override can be or should be and when. And uh, that's gonna drive staffing levels and activity levels and permit or disallow uh, personnel growth, growth or shrinkage. So it, it, it's operating a little bit differently than in the private sector, but um, the, 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 uh, the pressures are still there. And if, if the uh, override is at an unacceptable level and the voters don't support it, then the town uh, actually faces, the, 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 the town employees will be facing catastrophic uh, reductions and uh, town, townspeople will be facing dramatically reduced services. I don't know if I've said that accurately enough, but I think um, that's really the answer to your question. Yeah, and if I, if I may, Charlie, just the, you hit it right on the head. The, the paradigm in Arlington has been for a long time that when an override is passed within the confines of that override period, service maintenance is expected and promised, frankly, by the select board. So I, and these, these are obviously things that can be discussed and, and changed, but my current operating parameters are service level maintenance for the life of the override. And then as Charlie described, when that period is over, if decisions are made to no longer maintain that level of services, either, either by the town selected and appointed leaders or ultimately by the voters, uh, rejecting something at the ballot box, that's when the service level change is ultimately decided. Okay, thank you. I, I, I just might add, Adam, that uh, I think the service levels aren't cast in concrete. If we have severe uh, financial restrictions, um, you know, anticipatory cost reductions can adjust the demands for future overrides. I think, that, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, any other questions? Yes, Alan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. The, uh, I haven't had a chance to review the budget. Um, what's the status of the uh, trash hauling and disposal contracts? When uh, are we have to, when are we gonna have to go out to bid? Uh, what year will that, fiscal year will that impact? So the current contract that we're in ends at the end of FY22, so a year from this June 30th. So that would potentially impact FY23. We've been going back and forth with our waste hauler for over a year now. And just last week, they gave us a proposal that would change our cost structure for FY22 uh, and four years beyond that. The idea being, um, you know, th they're claiming to be bleeding money now because we pay zero dollars per ton for our recycling, and the market is charging a significant amount per ton to handle recycling. Um, so we, we've been in this really favorable position for this decade-long contract. So we're analyzing their proposal with our recycling coordinator and public works director, and then ultimately we'll decide if agreeing to something now smooths out any bumps over the next few fiscal years or whether we're better off waiting until next year to go out to bid. So I, that might be a little bit of a longer answer than what you were looking for, but um, we're, we're sort of in this scenario where we're, we are safe until the end of next fiscal year, but we're trying to see if there's a way that could be uh, mutually beneficial for the hauler in the town to extend something now. Is that both the hauling and the disposal contracts? So disposal of solid waste of trash is separate. Uh, it's one contract right now for, for hauling, physically hauling right. and recycling disposal. Okay, uh, just a couple other quick questions. The public health, uh, you have two new positions. We're gonna get uh, federal money to pay them 100% for the first six months of next fiscal year. And then town money would have to be used for the second six months. Is that correct? Correct. Now, uh, if the pandemic hopefully ends within the next fiscal year, 
I'm assuming that these two positions will be eliminated? Correct. If, if there's no longer need for their services, then yes, we will. We, we, we won't keep them on longer than they're than needed. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Al. Any other uh, questions for Mr. Chapdelaine? I, I, saw yeah, I have one question. And I do too. Go ahead, okay, Joe. I'm sorry. Who, let's, who, I'm having a hard time seeing who's uh, on first here. Who's? George is first and then me. Okay, George. Um, Madam, in the provision of level services, um, can you just briefly describe if that's at variance with what the plan was when the override was passed, which had increases? Or is uh, level service consistent with what the override intent was for this year? So the override commitments for town services were intended to be level services, except for an investment in mobility improvements in the amount of $200,000 a year, and then $50,000 a year for senior transportation. Uh, those are being, um, those are being met there. The 200,000 in the first year of the override was in the operating budget, but we in FY 21, this current fiscal year moved it into the capital budget and that's where it is now. Uh, it's $200,000 a year for mobility and the 50,000 for senior uh, transportation, th though it hasn't been much used this year for the, some of the reasons Sandy spoke about is still committed to in the senior transportation fund. And one more quick question is when does our trash disposal contract come to an end? If you, if you know. So our trash disposal with Wheelabrator, uh, you know, I'd have to verify, but I believe we have four more years on that. We renewed that last year. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So Adam, I have a couple of questions about personnel. Can you remind us all when our next round of contracts will need to be negotiated? Yes, they all current collective bargaining agreements expire this June 30th. So we are actually beginning bargaining with all units for successor agreements right now. Okay, and so this will have an impact on um, our future expense under the override, et cetera. Absolutely, yes. Okay, um, and in the past we have generally tried to keep increases to salaries below at, at or below 2%, correct? Uh, that is correct, yes. I mean, we've historically, we've always looked at comparable communities. Uh -huh. uh, we've tried to, both comparable communities and what they've granted for COLAs as well as what pay rates are in comparable communities. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've also used the CPI for some guidance in what COLAs will be. And historically over the past three, maybe even six years, I believe, um, COLAs have probably averaged below 2%. Okay, so is, are those COLAs intended to be an adjustment for increase in the cost of living for our employees or are they, I mean. I mean, if, I, if, I'm, being, if I'm being honest, we call them, we call them COLAs, right? And mm -hmm. they're applied mostly to people's base salaries, mm -hmm. but they're, they're, they're just negotiated pay increases. I mean, it's, there's terminology and then there's the reality that they're negotiated pay increases. Right. So in the past, for example, we may have signed contracts with our employees where they got a one or a one and a half or a 2% raise when the cost of living is actually going up faster than that. That is correct. Okay. So let me, and then on the health insurance side, have we adjusted the five-year plan for decreases in our healthcare growth rates? Like we used to do 7%. And then we were down to 5% as the cost factor there. Are we able to reduce it further or? So right now, um, so we've been budgeting five and a quarter percent growth as a premium growth for a number of years now. Right now, the GIC is projecting uh, a collective growth across all plans at 5.8%. We'll okay. know more in about two weeks about what those costs might actually be. And then they'll be finalized by March 1st. Um, we were, I was expecting better numbers based on lower healthcare utilization this past year. Um, so I, I hope to learn more about what's driving that, but it doesn't seem like we're gonna be able to lower below that five and a quarter percent for next year. Okay, um, and then final question. Um, uh, you referred to 
um, using a holding open positions strategy. Are you currently holding positions open that are in the budget? Yeah, so there, there's currently a number of DPW positions open. We've been, we've been strategically filling positions, but there are still a number that are open. Um, there are, we, we have started filling vacancies in police and fire, but over the next few months and then beyond that, we'll, we'll still keep, you know, we, we don't have a hiring freeze on, but we will make sure that we have a certain amount of vacancies open so that we're in that, you know, safer type position. Okay, and how many of those open positions currently are in the police department? How many are you filling? Can you give me an idea about that? So there are five vacancies in the police department, and I believe we're sending four people to the academy right now. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Annie. Uh, any other questions uh, for Adam? This is your chance, you know. Oh, Dave, Dave McKenna has his hand up. Oh, Dave. Where are you, Dave? Oh, I lost it. Go ahead, Dave. Adam, Adam my question about the um, under, under the contracts that, that are, all contracts that you negotiate are end in uh, June 30th? So uh, all the currently agreed to contracts end June 30th. Right now there is one bargaining all unit, the patrol, the, oh, sorry. the uh, patrol officers association that we are in arbitration with so that there is no agreed upon uh, contract for that unit. But yes, all, all agreed upon contracts expire June 30th. My concern on that is um, that's a multi-year contract that's still in negotiations, correct? Correct. So um, how many years has it been since they settled? For, it's just been since the start of this current three-year period. So it's back three fiscal years. So back to FY's 20, uh, I guess it'd be 19, 20, and 29. So my, my only concern is, is, is when that's, hopefully when it does settle, that people don't get the wrong idea when they see that it's it, it's a retroactive pay raise. You know, it's, it's going to look like it's inflated high, but but in reality, it, it, it's based upon the the previous three years, correct? Correct. Yeah. So any award from the arbitrator would spell out uh, what the you know what any financial award for each of the fiscal years would be. And we would just need to make sure, like, like you're saying, that we properly describe what the, what the award actually is. And we have been budgeting money to sufficiently fund okay. the contract. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, David. So, um, any other questions for the town manager? I'm sorry, I missed you before, David, but you were yes. off the screen. Yes. Shane. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about the diversity equity coordinator position and sort of what her role is, what sort of responsibility or authority she has? Sure. So when the position was created, it was focused on working with our Human Rights Commission Rainbow Commission and Disability Commission as both staff support and, uh, and advisor and, and professional advisor, uh, as well as working with the human resources director to advise on both the recruitment and retention of uh, a diverse workforce. So 
that I would say the core of that work has remained, uh, has stayed intact. Um, she's, she's working very hard and very regularly with those three uh, committees and commissions that I listed. Uh, additionally, I, I would say she's, she's doing a lot of work internally, working with departments who are interested in their um, either offering more diverse programming or strategizing around um, improving, uh, improving their, their workplace culture. She's also spending a lot of time that we definitely didn't anticipate uh, working with the community at, at large. She's now a, a key part of these racial justice teach-ins that we've been holding. Uh, it's a five-part series that uh, 60, over 60 people have signed up for uh, and two sessions have been held so far. Um, so she's, she, she's, got, she, she's become instantly a very, really integral part of the team. Uh, and I, I myself and, and Sandy as well, and Julie spend a lot of time working with her on a weekly, sometimes if not daily basis. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it breaks down into direct board committee and commission support, uh, HR support, uh, and then training both internally employee faced and uh, externally community faced. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Shane. Uh, I just wanted to apologize if, if I didn't see some of you. I just realized that um, I'm not seeing every uh, photo at the same time. I have to switch back and forth. So if you did want to say something and I haven't recognized you, please speak up. OK. Um, so th thank you, uh, Adam, for that. Uh, is there, are there other questions that pe members might have? switch back to the screen here. I don't see any hands up. So um, I have uh, two questions then, um, if, I may, if I might, Adam. And they're, they're sort of um, about the elephant in the room, at least in the room that the elephant that I see. And, um, and Dean uh, Carmen might correct me if I don't have my, if I haven't recalled these numbers precisely. But uh, my recollection is that there was a surplus in the school department in the, in fiscal year 20 of, of about, um, about 1.8 to $2 million. And uh, that there is another, another surplus that's somewhere between 1.3 and 1.8 million in this current fiscal year 21. So um, if, if this is an ongoing situation, um, this is something that can dramatically affect your $13 million you know, the, the override threshold. And um, my concern is that as a town, we recognize that this money should be coming back into the general fund to reduce the overall um, over, uh, over, overall taxation uh, that the citizens will be, the tax increases the citizens will be facing in the event of, of uh, the future override. You have any uh, direct comments that you'd like to make on that? I guess only that I, I, you know, I think from your comments tonight and conversations we've had at other meetings, you and I see eye to eye in that regard. Um, I know, uh, as you mentioned, Dean has been doing great work on on, on following and uh, I don't want to say chasing, fo fo following those figures and discussions at the school committee budget subcommittee level. And what, what I would hope is that the committee is willing to engage with us via the long range planning committee and potentially directly with the finance committee in um, acknowledging that surplus and deciding to either turn the entirety of it back to the general fund uh, at the end of the fiscal year so that it can become part of free cash and then accessible for use in future fiscal years. Or if there is some other means of um, benefiting both the schools and the town's position like they did last year, utilizing some surpluses to pay in advance some special education tuitions, um, that, that they'd be willing to do that so there can be, uh, as you're describing, sort of a fair, transparent uh, benefit to the general fund from any surpluses that exist. But I think that paying forward on those costs uh, needs to show a reflection in, in reduced budget demands in the future year, right? Because yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. Otherwise it'll just continue to carry. Yeah, okay. The, um, the second question, um, not unrelated, has to do with the student population um, growth 
or student population loss slash recovery. And um, so I think we have a position where we're looking at that fiscal year 2022 budget number and saying, okay, this amount of money is going to go into a reserve fund, which can be spent if the students come back and above the level of the 287 students that we lost last year. But I also think that it's, it's long been understood, at least on the finance committee, that the student population growth formula is a variable. In other words, the, the budget goes up when the growth in students go up, but the budget should be going down if the growth in students is going down. And um, so the, there is a, a question as to what the demographic trend, trend is, because I think we expected a leveling off of demographic demand sometime around 23 or 24, at least from the earlier demographic studies that we did several years back. And um, it's possible with the COVID and other things that happened that we may not go back into a growth mode. So um, are you in agreement that the student growth formula is variable and this means that those costs come out of the school budget? I would say that my understanding all the way back to 2011, uh, well, we started doing the growth factor 2013, 14, that all the way back to then, it was always clearly stated in long range planning committee meetings that it was intended to be a two way formula. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, last chance for questions on the town budget. May, may I ask one more question? Second yes, time George. So our last override, if I remember the number correctly, was five and a half million dollars on the operating side. And we are discussing numbers in the 13, 14, 15 million dollar range for 2024. Are we, is there a process in the long range planning committee or any place else to develop options or alternatives that might be going to the voters for some amount that is not as high as the 13, 14, 15 million. So since we've taken the liberty of talking about elephants in the room, I, I thought I would introduce my own elephant and, uh, and, and just ask if that has been a consideration in the discussions or whether it might, whether it might become one um, as we go forward this year and next. So I would say that the long range planning committee could just as accurately be called the scenario planning committee because of all the committees that we have, we produce countless scenarios uh, and, and have produced countless scenarios over the years, all the way back to 2011 when we had pay as you throw scenarios and no pay as you throw and overrides and, and you know, working through dozens of scenarios. So I, I think in short, the answer is, is yes, that Probably soon, we will start working up various scenarios that map out what, um, you know, map out what different amounts of an override look like, what different amounts of no override look like, you know, what, what, what it looks like both from a, an override point of view and what it might look like from a town and school budget point of view. So I, yeah, I think the answer is yes. Thank you, Adam. You're welcome. John. Oh, you're on mute, John. We can't hear you. You hear me? Yes. Um, of the towns we compare ourselves to, Arlington has about a, a third of the average commercial revenue, about $5 million a year. I know the town has done some studies about uh, commercial zones. And given the financial situation, I, I wondered what you thought the opportunity was for growth of commercial income up to levels comparable with um, the towns that uh, Arlington compares itself to. I think there may be some targeted ability uh, with a few key sites in town for some commercial development. Uh, I know there's a large residential development proposed in the MIRAC or on a portion of the MIRAC properties off of Mass Ave. Some of the, the additional MIRAC properties behind the automotive dealerships uh, could be a site the goal of Jim, uh, 
site could be a potential property that would be looked at as well as Arlington Coal and Lumber. Beyond that, um, and, you know, and frankly, the planning director could give a much more in-depth answer than this. We, over time, we've really only seen the potential for significant year-over-year -year commercial growth uh, being possible through mixed-use development along the commercial corridors and Broadway and in Mass Ave. Um, Large-scale commercial development um, is challenging in much of Arlington, uh, save maybe those three sites and maybe, you know, uh, the vacant lot that St. Camilla owns uh, up at Poets Corner because the transportation networks uh, in with the existing roadways in Arlington can't really serve a commercial a commercial demand, right? It's hard, it's it's hard to get to those sites from just about anywhere. Um, so that that's a that's a limitation. Um, so I I, th I think the answer is yeah. There are a couple sites with potential, um, but there I I don't really believe there's some hidden um, hidden site where that that could just spur year over year commercial development. Thank you, Adam. John, does that answer your question? Thank you. So I, I just uh, har harking back to Adam's previous comment about the scenarios and the implications of those scenarios. I just wanted to mention a reef. Um, that's the uh, that's the way the town responds to your concern concerns raised earlier. In other words, the that that override hurdle and the scenarios to address it um, so, sort of govern growth or reductions in staffing and in other expenses. So uh, anyone else? Charlie, it's Dean. Yes. Can I, can uh, I add, Dean. Can I add a- And then can Annie. I, can I add a clarification to something you had brought up for the, um, in your questions that most people probably don't have background on? Yes, please go right ahead. So in Charlie's questioning, he referenced a school surplus and was talking about what to do with it. So just so everybody understands the background. Um, when we got to the end of last fiscal and school year, so June of 2020, the school department found that they had spent less money that they had budgeted. Mm -hmm. um, what they chose, what the school CFO did at that moment was he returned $600,000 to the general fund. He put $400,000 into the special ed reserve fund. And then he chose to prepay this year's special ed out of district by $1.3 million. So when we're referring to these surpluses that need to come back to the town at some point, we're really talking about the 1.3 million and the, the, how, that, how, how it got created and how it would impact the town's budget going forward. Now, before I go any further, I do wanna make it very clear that if faced with the facts and circumstances that if I was faced with the facts and circumstances that Mike Mason was looking at in June of 2020, I would have done exactly what he did, okay? So there's no degree of criticizing the decision-making. It's just simply looking at it and saying, okay, if we get past the crisis, you know, what is going to be our long-term budgetary policy for dealing with surpluses? And some of this is a history that predates most all of this probably is driven by history that predates the current CFO and will be here long after he's gone. But, but I just wanna make clear that, that that's what we're looking at. It's not like the school department is doing something nefarious or terrible or whatnot. It's just understanding, okay, they took great actions during a crisis. Now, as we move out, hopefully back to normalcy, how do we handle it? Thank, thank you, Dean. Andy. Yes, so um, is the scenario planning committee modeling pay as you throw? for 2024, Adam, given that we now have a zero waste committee and we know pay as you throw is one of the prime ways to drive the production of waste down. So I'd say right now, no, that's not on the table. Um, I, I have felt for a long time that given, I, I guess I've always felt like given the Arlington's specific need for consideration of tax overrides that a pay-as-you-throw fee um, just wouldn't work. So it's not currently being discussed. If recycling costs uh, go, go up at sort of the higher end of where things go up, that might prompt us to have to do something. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm saying it's not currently on the table, but it doesn't mean that it, in, in the next year that it won't be something we discuss. Thank you, Adam. So I think at this point, it's appropriate to turn the uh, committee, uh, the meeting back to your uh, next uh, phase of your discussion. So if you could move ahead on that, please. Adam. All right, so Julie, uh, Julie Wayman, management analyst, is going to walk through the FY22 capital, uh, capital budget and plan. Thank you, Julie, go ahead. Thanks, Adam. So um, first, I just want to mention that uh, the Capital Planning Committee is going to be coming before all of you on March 10th. So at that time, we will be going into the plan in far greater detail. So tonight, I'm just going to basically go over um, what you see on your screen, which is our 5% calculation sheet, just to give a sense, give you all a sense of where we stand with the numbers. So this sheet is in uh, the manager's budget on page 198, if you want to look back at it. Um, but it breaks down for us um, a nice summary of the plan. So at the top in red, you can see uh, how we intend to pay for the capital plan. So um, the first two lines are our uh, non-exempt debt service. The first line being our prior debt service. Uh, and the second line being what we anticipate our debt service will be after our um, the sale of our debt next month. The third line down is the cash cost to the plan. Uh, and the total plan for 22 coming in at 11, just over $11 million. You can see 23 through 26 are also right around $11 million. As a reminder, this is just our non-exempt debt service. So this does not include our FY22 um, exempt debt service, which is about $6.3 million. So this next box down in blue are our direct funding sources. So while the plan does cost $11, uh, $11 million, we do have a number of other sources that we um, deduct from that 11 when calculating our um, percent of the total uh, town budget. So you can see here a number of funds. You can also see the um, sale proceeds from the sale of the Disabled American Veterans Building. Uh, and you can also see that we pull out the um, override commitments when we're calculating that 5%. So the final box here down in green is where we do that calculation. Um, and so we take what our uh, net cost of the plan, that 8.6 million, and we divide by what we anticipate our FY22 budget to be. Um, and in 22, we are at 5%. You can see that in 23 and 24, we're above 5% though 25 and 26, we um, anticipate being a bit below 5%. And um, on average over that five years, we are coming right now just below 5%. I also wanna mention that when we come back on March 10th, we are hoping that these numbers here in this row are going to be a little bit lower. Again, these are the estimated debt service numbers. Um, once we sell the debt, we did, uh, we were a little bit conservative with the interest rate. so. Um, you know, if they do come back a little bit better, these numbers might be um, a little bit lower on the 10th. Uh, and then finally, um, you'll see in the um, capital budget that there is a request from the facilities department and the school department, a co-request for um, $150,000 for engineering studies. So this is to um, allow the facilities department to look at the um, HVAC, the roofs, the infrastructure, and um, also energy efficiency upgrades to some of our schools. So um, we are anticipating there will probably be some future capital requests based on these engineering studies. And that's going to be that's going to be it for the capital plan for tonight. Thank you, Julie. Are there any questions about the uh, capital plan? Yes, Al. Is it appropriate at this point to ask for an update on the status of the uh, high school construction project? It is. Uh, Adam or Sandy, are you prepared to address that? Sure, sure. I, we have our high school building committee meeting tomorrow night, so I might have been better prepared on Wednesday. But um, uh, yeah, I would say in general, Al, we are on schedule and on budget. 
they're uh, maybe maybe even under budget, and we have some um, some ability to be take a look back at things that had been pushed out of the project and consider adding them back back in. There are um, there's a potential schedule impact for some of the steel work that we're currently working through in trying to get the contractor back uh, back on time through starting uh, a little bit earlier in the mornings, uh, and we're working through some of the details on. Uh, some of those potential addbacks and whether or not they would have a potential schedule impact or how that could be worked around. But um, I, I would say in, in broad strokes, we are both, we're both on time and on budget and things are proceeding very well. I think that was a, that was a kudos from some of the audience there, uh, Adam. We'll take it. Um, any other questions on the capital plan? I think Alan Jones is raising his hand. Oh, really. Sorry, Alan. I'm, I'm, thank you, Alan. Yeah, this is sort of a retrospective of the last town meeting. We, um, the town meeting approved an increase in the DPW uh, renovation plan. And part of the increase of that cost was uh, to shift some of the uh, departments from the original high school plan, um, which increased the cost of the DPW project which presumably will also decrease the cost of the high school project at all. Has that been uh, accounted for? Or was the high school budget decreased by an appropriate amount based on the increase in the DPW budget? It, it was, but that all happened before the debt exclusion for the high school. So those decisions to move facilities, move IT, th those happened to get down to that $290.8 million figure, which the debt exclusion was based on. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes, John Dice. Um, yes, Adam. Um, uh, are there any more surprises relative to that upgrade of the DPW, or are things proceeding well now? Well, th this is not intended to be glib at all. I hope the next surprise is that when we get our bids back, that they follow the trend of the high school bids and that they're significantly lower than estimate. So I, I hope we can start to, to tighten things up. Um, outside of that, uh, no, I, I don't. There, I don't anticipate there being any any other surprises. I, I suppose the risk profile is probably greatest for when they actually start putting um, scoops in the ground because of the contamination. There's potential for there being greater risk than what was identified when they uh, profiled the soil. Uh, but I, they've done a lot of uh, pre-soil characterization to try to figure out what's there. So we, we should be, but I would say if there is risk, that's the greatest risk area. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, George is raising his hand, Charlie. George, go ahead, sorry. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I'm just curious if we have an estimate of what the total value of the town assets are. Our formula is based on 5% of expenditures, which is sensible, but there's also another way of looking at it, which is if we look at our capital spending each year and we look at our asset base, we can divide one by the other and you know, have a rough estimate of how, we, how long we think our assets are lasting. And my question is, have we ever looked at that and often in government, of course, you don't spend enough really to keep things up because you expect periodic, you know, rebuilds with state funding or other kinds of funding. Um, obviously, there's a lot of small capital items that we do have to keep up because we're not going to pass, you know, a debt exclusion for, for the smaller stuff. But I'm just curious if we have an estimate of what the total value of the assets of the town is and what fraction of that we spend every year in the capital budget. So I would say the best, the best document that we, well, I guess there's two things we could look at, either our property insurance values or what the assessor is valuing the properties at. I'm gonna guess, and Sandy, jump in here if you disagree, that looking at our insurance statement of values is probably gonna be a more accurate depiction of the values than, than the assessor. I, I don't know that the assessor really does a thorough going over or doesn't really have a framework for valuing a, a, like a large scale governmental building. Um, so I, I think we have a starting point. Um, I, I'd have to pull it out and we could divide our capital capital budget by it. I, I'm not positive that even that statement of values would necessarily be accurate, right? We could dig into it a little more and see how 
accurate it is, but so I, I can't cite it for you tonight, but we could definitely do that. Sandy? I would just add, um, we do in our annual CAFR, which is our audit that Ida in her office uh, leads on, we do have a schedule of our depreciated values. So there is a set of values that way, but it's based on depreciation, which is not really the cost of, of repairing or replacing something. That is something that the town has dealt with numerous times over the years, trying to figure out how much work needs to be done at, on or at various locations. Um, it's one of the reasons with our new um, facilities manager, he took out a number of projects that had been guesstimated in the capital plan for some work at, at various buildings and said, instead, give me $150,000 to do an analysis of what shape these are in. As Julie said, looking at HVAC, looking at roofs, uh, looking at their energy efficiency. Um, I think in the long run, trying to get to that number of what these repair costs are gonna be is probably the most important. I would just also add that I worked in a number of different communities and spending 5%, I would say in my humble opinion is probably the minimum that one needs to spend in order to um, have a sufficient spending and to maintain your assets. Um, and it, it may not even be sufficient in my opinion. So that's my two cents. Uh, if I can add to your two cents, uh, Sandy, uh, the 5% represents the non-exempt spending that we undertake. But in the last 20 years, the town has spent uh, probably, um, including the high school, probably close to a half a billion dollars in uh, capital expenditures on the school systems. Roughly. That's, yeah, that's right. Mr. Um, Chairman? Yes. So following up on Sandy's comment, so if you, on the, the CAFR lists, um, as a footnote that lists the town's assets before depreciation on an acquisition cost. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an okay, it's a probably an understated metric because for example, the high school, which is like a hundred years old, would have no base, would have, would have like the acquisition cost from 1920, right? Plus additions. Um, using that as a metric, the town records $259 million of capital assets on its books before depreciation. Which is, which is less than the cost of the high school. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I give that long preface. So you, so I'd be ready for that comment. <laughs> okay. Any other uh, comments? Thank you all. Capital budget. Did I see? Okay. Well, Julie, thank you very much for, uh, for that presentation and bringing us into uh, these varied subjects. Thank you. So um, that sort of brings us to the, well, I don't know, is that the end of your, uh, the, the subjects you wanted to cover? Uh, Adam, Sandy, Julie, or do you have more? That's all that we wanted to present, but if there's other questions, uh, anything else the committee wants to discuss, happy to happy to answer any other questions. So, so Adam's opening himself up to your clutches again. Um, so are there uh, any additional questions after this discussion that uh, you would like to uh, ask the town manager and his team? Okay, well, Adam, Sandy, Julie, thank you very much for a very uh, informative presentation. And uh, I think that will uh, give us the, uh, the fire and ambition to uh, dig into these expenses in each of the departments. And uh, then we'll be back and discussing them again with you uh, in the future. That's great. Thank you. Thank, thank you all very it. much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Great, great, great job. Thank, thank you. you. Nice work. <clears throat> How are we doing for time here? Oh, we're just about on time, amazing. Okay, so th the next subject um, uh, is our uh, information systems working group strategy. 
And uh, Anne, Andy LaCourt is going to uh, bring us up to speed and, on, on uh, what their vision and activities are. So Andy, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Great. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, so I'm going to share the screen while I walk through these slides. And then when we go to questions, I will stop sharing the screen so I can see everybody's faces. Um, but somebody will have to help me monitor hands. Um, so I want to remind you all what it was that Charlie asked the Information Systems Working Group to work on at the beginning of the year. And so we were looking to do a handful of things. So provide a platform for increased collaboration for the committee. Improve the process by which the committee produces its report, avoiding some of the inaccuracy and miscommunication about changes that currently occurs. And that is mostly that we make decisions in the committee. They don't necessarily get communicated directly to Sandy very quickly. Documents get produced before numbers have been updated. Sandy and Alan kind of struggle to keep their versions of the budget coordinated, so on and so forth. And we're hoping to smooth out some of that, those issues. Um, no fault, no blame on anybody. It just has to do with the systems that we have available at the moment to manage that. And the fact that budgets are best done in spreadsheets. We can't actually count on an application that's going to be easy to use. Um, and then we wanted to create a historical record of our work. And we wanted to increase capability to do more historical analysis and to model future impacts to the budget, um, external sources of data, so on and so forth. The email Charlie sent me was very articulate on this point. I would let him articulate his thinking uh, beyond that um, if people want more detail on the kinds of things that uh, he was thinking of. So we have been working on these things in a sort of a near-term, mid-term, long-term model. And the near term for us was to increase, um, you know, to create this collaboration platform um, and to see what we could do to begin to work on the improvement of the process of producing our report from the budgets produced by the town and coordinating that communication so we have fewer uh, moments of being startled or having to correct things after they've been printed, et cetera, um, and creating a historical record of our work. Um, the historical analysis and modeling capability is probably further down the road than anything else. That's sort of our long-term strategy. Um, and that improving of communications is both things we're working on now and uh, what I would call midterm to the process, because it will take a while to figure out exactly how we can better coordinate. Um, so, uh, what that leads to is the question that I think is probably on everybody's mind, which is why are we implementing 365 in SharePoint? So we're doing that for a couple of different reasons. So the IS working group believes, and, and I think based on the survey we did of the committee, a lot of committee members believe that we need a better way to share documents and Office 365 and SharePoint point are the tool that the town is adopting. And so in order for us to also coordinate with all the department heads and all the other people in the town that we work with, using the same platform is kind of important. Um, in addition to um, Office 365 and SharePoint, ultimately the town, I believe, for remote meetings will be moving to Teams and we will all have access to Teams to use as a tool for remote meetings. Um, although I suggest that many people will want to go back to in-person meetings after we are uh, out of the pandemic, for some of us, continuing to do remote meetings is more in line with how we work now with all the rest of our in all the rest of our life, and it'll be nice to have that tool available to us to communicate with department heads, etc. Um, Using SharePoint will also allow us to create that historical record of our work. We read and produce and review. Uh, a lot of documents, not all of which actually get posted to the website, not all of which are pertinent to decisions, so on and so forth. The, the structure that we've put in place inside SharePoint will allow us to keep all that work product year by year and be able to look back and forward at what we did last year, what we're doing this year, what we did five years ago, so on and so forth. And those documents will also be available to the town because they will be in the town's system and platform and therefore create 
a record that is responsive to any FOIA request um, that might come for our work product. And then um, this tool makes it easier for us to share documents and changes to the budgets with the finance department because they will be using the same tool. And so it's just a question of sliding a file over to a different folder for Sandy to give us something or vice versa. And we have a plan for how we might create a picture on a daily basis of the changes that come out of our meetings to a budget so that it can, Sandy can immediately see how that compares to his budget. It's a spreadsheet manipulation kind of thing that you know, probably don't care about the details of, but we're hoping that will help with some of this um, you know, misalignment that sometimes occurs between um, what Sandy has in his documents and what we have in ours. So that's sort of the big picture of why we're doing this. And I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and just take any questions you have about this um, uh, and see whether or not any of my compatriots on the committee want to weigh in and expand on that at all. And I can see Alan's editing my slides, so he may want to jump in. <laughs> so, Alan, were you going to say something? <laughs> no, I just wanted to correct Office 365 to Microsoft 365. It's changed. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so, um, okay. so, Andy, that actually uh, is, you know, I think Alan has uh, subtly made a good point there. Because uh, one of the advantages, I think, are that whether it's a PowerPoint or a, um, a Excel spreadsheet or Word document or whatever, uh, any of us that are working on something here together can actually uh, edit these documents in real time while we're sharing them. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yes, we had a fun exercise in training session number two where Bill... Keller made a document and then Daryl and Alan and I were all adding things to it before everybody's very eyes. So I think, I think that's a quite a bit of um, going to be going to be a benefit as we go through our, uh, our mm -hmm. meetings with our, with our uh, departments. Mm -hmm. So um, Daryl or George, did you want to make any comments uh, as well after uh, our meetings this week, our training sessions this week? Um, I mean, I thought on the whole, the training went pretty well. Um, you know, it is new. Some people, it's just going to be a matter of getting exposure to it and increased comfort with it. But I think the, the benefits will um, reveal themselves pretty quickly. I guess I'd just like to add that if folks have questions or would like some more information about how to use SharePoint, to please get a hold of one of us, um, Annie, Alan, Daryl, or myself, and we're happy to set up a time to uh, to walk through you know, any particular questions that you have. We understand that this is kind of different for anyone who hasn't used this before, which is most of the committee. So if you weren't able to make the training sessions or would like, again, some extra time, um, we are available um, really throughout the spring, the winter and spring but especially early on, if you've got questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, please. Uh, George? Bill Keller here with, uh, with a quick question. Uh, you've all been very helpful, Annie, especially uh, today. Uh, you spent uh, quite a bit of time going over things. Uh, I need as much remedial, remedial help as possible. I'm not the most tech savvy person in the room, but uh, it's coming slowly. I guess my question mm -hmm. is, are, were these training sessions recorded so that it'd be uh, in some fashion where I could go back or someone could go back and, and just review the training mm -hmm. without coming back to one of you each time we have a question uh, to help help let this uh, new information and platform cement itself? Yeah, so we did not record the training sessions, Bill. But better than recording the training sessions might be just one of us getting on Zoom and recording walking through the slides with a demonstration of the steps on the screen. Because in the trainings, we were sort of adapting on the fly to whoever was on, the, on with us. And I'm not sure any of those trainings would have produced a, a particularly slick 
training video, but we could consider doing something like that. Or there may be some training slides out there on YouTube that we can find. Okay. Uh, I certainly send a lot of YouTube videos out to my Salesforce clients to help them do that. Um, and while I have the floor, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Grant Gibbion has also been on the committee with us and has done a lot of work to help us get to this moment. He just didn't have, uh, he was between computers. And so him helping out with the training was going to be tough. So um, don't want him to be left behind. So, <clears throat> Any other questions for this uh, team while we have them? Yes, Peter. You're on mute, Peter. Thank you. Um, in the training session, there was a mention of a uh, structure of, of uh, files. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as I can tell, there isn't much structure there now. You, mm -hmm. you, you, suggest, you said there would be uh, mm -hmm a file for each uh, working little, uh, what do we call ourselves, task groups maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and sh sh mm -hmm. sh shall I go ahead and, and, and uh, establish a, a file for, for general government and- So, so Peter, there, there is a file for general government. It's, I can't find it. Okay, so perhaps we should offline, I should walk you through that. What, maybe uh, just for the sake, uh, for, it wouldn't take more than a couple of seconds just to bring up a SharePoint on, on your screen, Annie, and share it and show yeah. people where that is. So this is our SharePoint site, okay. And um, so we have uh, a file for each year, a folder for each year of, of budget. And then the cappers and paffers are here. Um, and then I think there's some, whoa, Alan, are you messing around with my stuff? You're, you're in the IS team site, Annie. You should be in the oh, FinCon I'm the site. Team. I wanna be on, let me go back. Uh, I wanna be on finance committee, I lied. Okay, let's get to the right spot, guys. Okay, so there's an Arlington FY22 budget folder at top level. So if you, um, uh, let me back out of here. So if I'm on the office homepage and I go to SharePoint, I get here and I go to the finance committee and then this is the finance committee homepage where our meeting schedule is set up and so on and so forth. And I go over here to documents, then I get to what I call top level folders. So one of those top level folders is for this year for the Arlington FY 2022 budget year. And if I go into that folder, there is a folder called FY 22 assigned budgets. And inside that folder is a folder for each of our groups who work on budgets together. Thank you very much. I didn't think to look there. Yeah. So I and and I know folder structures can sometimes make people crazy because you kind of go, well, hi, why do I have to do so many clicks, et cetera, et cetera? But it is about sort of keeping things organized so that if I need to quickly find something, I can find it. Um, but I also want to remind everybody that up here in search, if I'm at the top level and I want to see the manager's budget, for example, I can just do a search for it and it will come up. <coughs> so search is your friend. Uh, so so where, where are the, can I ask another question? Sure. Um, where are the, uh, Minute, uh, history of the minutes going to go. Okay. So what I am encouraging Liz to do is to create a folder for each meeting here. So you can see we have a February 1st, 2021 budget. Where, where'd you come from? I didn't see where that came from. All right. If I'm at the top level in documents and I go to the fiscal year, then there's an FY22 meetings. Oh, meetings there, okay. 
Okay, and then inside that, we're hoping to create a folder for each meeting date with <coughs> documents in it. So uh, will, will the agendas go in there also? Yes, that is the theory, that the agenda would go in there and the minutes that would go in a folder would be the minutes you're gonna vote on that night. What, what about the draft minutes? So the draft minutes, Peter, would depend on where you, where, how you want to produce them. Right. So if you're planning on writing them out in in a Word doc on the computer as we go, then I would say start them in the folder for the meeting. But if you're still going to do them by hand and you're going to produce them afterwards, I would produce them and upload them into the folder for the meeting as a PDF, by the way, into the folder for the meeting that we, they're going to be voted on in because that's where we're going to have to read them. Am I making sense? No, that's fine. But you need to do that. I think you and Liz need to work out kind of a rhythm about that. So uh, my, my, I guess what I would suggest is, uh, uh -huh. is having draft versions uh -huh. and having a final version uh -huh. uh, that <clears throat> that would also exist in the uh -huh. in the town side on the town's uh, uh, website. Uh -huh. On the website? I don't think you mean on the website, Peter. That's where it is now. Drafts? Not the drafts, no, the final, right. the voted one version. Yeah, the final version will go from here to the website. Oh, but, we have but both yes. Should it, I, I mean, should it be in both places? The, the final version would likely be in both places, yes. Yeah. I'll be posting it in both places, I believe. Like we usually do, it's just in a different folder, Pete. Yeah. What would be in a different folder? The final version is just not gonna be held on my computer somewhere in a folder that says minutes. It will now be in this FY22, um, each, you know, the, the specific night of the meeting that you approve it. So tonight's meeting minutes will be in Wednesday night's folder, the final version. Right. And so then I will, oh, I'll definitely post them in Document Central and then onto the town website as well. And the, so we can put the drafts and the final version in that folder you just referred to. Um, yes. I, would the draft go into that folder too, Annie? For, to, for Wednesday, or would the fi only the final go into it? I, I it's what people read. Yeah, whatever people are going to vote on is what should go in the meeting folder. Which is the draft until we vote on it. Right. right. I would just change the name from draft to final, not yep. have two yep. separate files. Yep. Yeah, so I'd say that's more you a status of the document than a separate document. Uh, Alan, quite often there is a difference between the two. If you're trying mm -hmm. to well, make the changes and then call it, make the changes, vote on it and call it final. Do you, do you want to keep the history or not? Well, okay, let's, uh, I may we're getting That's too much into the conversation. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think maybe uh, Peter, you and uh, Liz and Annie can so, sort of work or, or Alan can work this out afterwards. Okay. All right. Fine. Okay. Okay. Other Thank questions? you, Annie. Uh, any other questions for Annie or comments? I have a question, Charlie. Yes, John. It's a general question about what were traditionally our meetings with department heads. How, how are we supposed to conduct those this year? So well, you, have, you have a couple different options. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you what I recommended to Bill when we discussed this when he and I did our one-on-one. -on -one. I would say your first line of defense is to talk to the department head and say, hey, can you set up a Zoom meeting on a town Zoom account and invite our committee members to it? So put the onus back on the town employee who probably has already been using Zoom consistently. Um, your second line of defense is to say, okay, I'll set up the meeting. And the meeting would also be done on the town Zoom account that we use for our finance committee meetings now. And you could get either Liz or I to help you schedule that and put the link in and so on and so forth. If you are familiar with Teams, Teams is available through the SharePoint site 
and you are welcome to use Teams to set up your department head meeting, but it's certainly not required. And we just didn't feel like we had the bandwidth to train everybody on Teams. And we certainly didn't wanna switch our meeting tool right now when most of the rest of the town has not instituted Teams yet. So that's kind of where we're at. Okay, I'll just comment that I got an injection today. I got the vaccine today, so yes! I'm a lot better. Yay, that's awesome. <laughs> so maybe an in-person meeting is even possible. Uh, just... Maybe. <laughs> well, you know, an in-person meeting following social distancing rules and masks and so forth is certainly possible. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, I saw a very interesting article in the Wall Street Journal today about the NFL and what they found out about the uh, uh, in, infectious nature of the COVID, mm -hmm. and that it's much, uh, it's much more uh, easily spread than advised by the CDC. So, uh, you know, if you do want to have an in-person meeting, first of all, you got to make sure that the uh, the town department is okay with that, and there's a facility available to do it in a safe manner. And uh, and secondly, I think. Based on what I read today, you have to be really careful, really careful. Okay, well, I'm sitting on my couch in my library right now, which is very comfortable and a lot more comfortable <laughs> than most office chairs. That's there so you cool. go. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions for, uh, for Annie or, or anybody on the information systems working group? Yeah, are we all supposed to bring our cats to these meetings? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yes, apparently, although I only have a dog. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. All right, so uh, thank you very much on that, Annie. Appreciate it. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, another subject, which is this uh, point of new initiatives. I sit down a little uh, doc. Pardon me? Somebody. I think Dave's talking. Dave. I wasn't talking, but uh, now if you're asking me, I just want to let John Dice know I'm getting the second shot Thursday. <laughs> good. Good for you. Very good. Good for you. Okay. Um, so let me share my screen. And uh, see if that's going to work, that's going to work. OK. So um, I, I would like to uh, mention uh, that uh, I sent out this document today and mentioned uh, in the agenda that um, that I'd like to set out some new initiatives for the Finance Committee. And um, you might think we've been talking about a new initiative for the last half an hour, which is true, but I think we, I think we can handle more than one initiative at a time. Um, so, uh, shucks, excuse me, but I'm having trouble, there we go. So uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the background as to why uh, I'm suggesting these initiatives and what the objectives are. And then I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the three uh, detailed uh, initiatives. Now, I ha have spoken to a lot of you about these in the last several days. Some of you I missed and sent some emails to, some I called and you know we, we need to link up. But I ask that you just bear with me here, and then we'll we'll catch up on this uh, more during the next week. So, um, you know, the, the background here is similar to some of the th reasons why uh, we set out on the with the information systems working group to to change our our platforms, and and the um, you know we ha we've had a long and successful history of working with the various. Uh, departments in the town, but the world is changing. It's becoming, um, you know, the the, the uh, town moderator wants to go to an all electronic, uh, uh, all digital town meeting. Um, the 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 working world is moving towards uh, higher degrees of collaboration. Uh, in the in the context of all this, we've also had trouble 
uh, from, from my viewpoint, recruiting new members. We have, we have some excellent at-large members, but the statute says that we have to have, or we're supposed to have a member from each precinct in the town. And the Town Manager Act uh, has, allows us to use at-large members only for a limited period of time. So we've got to focus on how we get back to our uh, membership being drawn from each precinct in the town. Um, so as part of this thinking, uh, I'm proposing um, that or suggesting that we have three fundamental needs. One, as suggested by various people, uh, Dean has mentioned it, Alan's mentioned it, Andy's mentioned it, that we need to document and plan uh, our activities. And secondly, uh, as I was just mentioning with respect to getting new members, we have to figure out a way to publicize the story of the Finance Committee and get new members to join it. And then thirdly, um, I think we, going forward, we need to deepen our knowledge of the town and school operations, especially in the context of the st structural deficits. The, the discussion we had with the town manager tonight, where we're talking about a 13 or $15 million uh, override is, is, is pretty shocking. So, um, you know, we have to figure out a way to uh, understand how we can help the town contain its expenses in the face of, of uh, our, con our uh, consistent uh, structural deficit. So um, the first thing I want to mention is that uh, you know, I'm presenting these as ideas. This is not any edict being handed down from on high. Um, and I'm trying to address the three issues of recording our records and policies and how we, how, how we act and work, um, getting our narrative out to the public and, and categorizing or cataloging all the information that we can about the current historical nature of the town departments. Now, the reason I've proposed these working groups is that I also have a personal objective here. And that is, I, I would like to see the responsibility and authority for the direction that the Finance Committee takes get spread out more than it is throughout the committee. I would like to see the members of the Finance Committee empowered to affect our future direction. And I'd like to see us have a process where we grow our own leadership for the future. Now, that, that's very high level and you know, grand ideas. Um, I don't know exactly how we're gonna get to uh, implement it all in practice, but at least if we think about these things, we can think about how we're gonna get there. So um, with respect to, com to uh, the whole idea of getting the narrative of the finance committee out to the public, and, and helping in our recruiting, um, I'm suggesting that what we should have is a, what I call a communications working group. And uh, Arif Padaria has agreed to be the leader of this group. And I've talked to some of you about joining it and I'll be reaching out to a couple of others that I, that I haven't quite caught up with yet. But the idea is that this group will sort of develop ways for us to get our narrative, first of all, uh, to the, all of the department departments in the town so that they, they understand not just that we come around and look at their budgets, but that um, we have a, an overall uh, philosophy and way of working with the town, with the town meeting, what we're doing and why we're doing it, et cetera. And then we need to get this story out to the public because if the public doesn't know what we're doing, they're not gonna wanna, you know, people don't necessarily will not necessarily have a motivation to join the finance committee. And, and if we are going to be successful in recruiting people from each precinct, we have to have that public interest and hopefully that demand from the public to join, um, uh, to join the committee. So um, I've asked Arif and I'm looking forward to his leadership here in creating uh, a way to achieve these objectives. And we'll come, come back to that, to the, to the charter there in a second. Then um, with respect to our, uh, I'm just trying to get rid of my, I'm blocking my own screen here with the uh, Zoom. Uh, um, so with respect to the um, 
the idea of documenting where we've been and where we're going, um, I'm suggesting that a policy and procedures working group or a policy working group. And think about this in, in, in sort of two categories. One is to just write down, it, maybe it's, maybe it's a, um, an Arlington Finance Committee manual or uh, some, some document like that on our, our new shared SharePoint facility, but something that describes all of the things we do and how we do it and why we do it. It also can describe the, the various relationships we have. Um, you know, I found out recently that, that Annie is our delegate to the uh, Vision, uh, Envision Arlington Committee. And I, I didn't know we had a, had a uh, delegate to the Envision Arlington Committee. And so I'm sure we have other relationships like that that we should at least record for, for everybody else in the, in the uh, committee to, to know about. And then uh, there may be things that we want to consider about where we go in the future. How, how do we elect officers? What sort of governance do we want to have? Or we might want to think about uh, more working groups and support services fitting into the, to the functions of the committee. These are, these are just concepts, right? Um, and I've asked Christine to, to sort of lead this group and hopefully we'll come out with something that's uh, workable and usable uh, by the finance committee uh, in the future. And then the third is what I call the operations research working group. Um, <clears throat> after Christine published, Christine and, and Jonathan and Daryl published the, um, the Arlington Police Department study report last summer, uh, a number of people on the committee suggested that we could probably do this with other um, departments. And, and um, I think uh, Annie suggested the uh, DPW. And, um, uh, there were a couple of other suggestions. And, and you know, it's, in the long run, it would be good to have a resource like that for all of the departments. So my thought is that this operations research working group being led by Al Tosti would come up with a plan to prioritize how we would do this, who would do it, when it would happen, et cetera, so that we would be building up a database of information about the town and schools. So th that would be available for reference by um, finance committee members as, as they carry out their, their work in the future. So th these are just the three, three ideas um, to, to move forward in, in some of the objectives that I mentioned earlier. So what does this mean with respect to process? Um, I, you know, what I've, what you've seen here in the slides, as I said earlier, these are ideas, right? So I'm hoping that the working groups will develop their own charter and schedules. In other words, I'm not dictating or uh, other than making a suggestion here about the directions that we might take. I'm hoping that the working group can develop the plans and recommendations of how we go forward, but only the finance committee makes the final decisions. In other words, the working groups come up with a plan or recommendation or whatever, but it should be presented to the finance committee as a, a way forward and gets, gets sold to, bought in by and voted by the full committee. Um, I've tried to structure this so that the working groups are less than a, a finance committee quorum so that we don't run afoul of the open meeting law uh, inadvertently. We have to be careful about that. And then uh, <clears throat> I hope that the, each working group will um, plan regular updates um, or reports to the committee to keep the, the uh, committee apprised of what's going on. Just for example, the way uh, Annie has done tonight, and I think she did uh, at one of the earlier meetings in the fall. So um, this is just a, a sort of a concept, a very, very light, blueprint or path that we might take to address these three, uh, these three areas. And I'm hoping that the groups will, um, you know, grab a hold of this, come up with more concrete ideas and present uh, some plans on how we could move forward um, in these areas. So what I'm gonna do in the next week is, is, um, is send out a, a couple of uh, emails that will, gather together all of the names of the people in the various groups that I've been talking to, which is not completely organized yet, uh, but it will be shortly. And then 
um, you can people that are, that are working in these efforts can um, get together and collaborate with the team leader and uh, figure out how we go forward. So uh, I think that's the, the process that I'm suggesting and I hope that uh, people can embrace it. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about all this stuff. No questions. So I got a question, Charlie. Ah, yeah. I wanted to volunteer to be a member of one of those working groups. How would I go about doing that? Uh, send me a note. OK. I, I, you know, I just what, what, the, be, candidly, uh, you, anybody can volunteer to be on any one. What, I, what I've tried to do is um, be, be light on the, you know, the people that are working on the information systems working group already have, you know, I'm, some commitment. So I'm trying to spread the load around a little bit, but don't feel bashful about um, taking on more burden for the greater good of the finance committee. I think that's great. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? Um, let's see. I can't tell. I guess, I guess I have everybody on the screen here. Sometimes I see two screens and sometimes I see one. I don't know, understand the, uh, I have to get the Zoom thing down. So, um, okay, so I guess the one comment, I the other comment I wanted to make about these uh, working groups is that not only are, do they define their own charter and objectives, but also set their schedules. These are not meant to be something that gets done in a week these you know some of these things are going to take a couple of years maybe even more to, to carry get carried out in full but what i'm hoping is that um everybody will be participating in these and together um sort of directing where the finance committee is going in the future it sounds a little a little heady probably but um I hope we can all. Yes, George. Charlie, I, I think this is wonderful. Um, have you had discussions with the town manager about sort of the issue of where is kind of a, a useful division between things that are primarily financial and budgetary, which are, are our focus, and which issues get to be more managerial, and whether we should, or maybe you've already had a conversation about how to work sort of harmoniously uh, and kind of pulling in the same direction. Um, because I think whenever we talk to our departments, you know, all sorts of issues come up that are sort of in that gray area. And I guess I'm just wondering if we want to have, perhaps have a consistent policy across the working groups that at least is guidance on what we focus on or whether it's not an issue. So I'm, I'm just curious where, where we might be on that. Uh, George, I think that's a very good uh, point, and um, it is an issue. Um, I, and I, I actually talked uh, at some length about it with with Al Tosti, especially in this operations research side. And and I think uh, Christine did a, a a wonderful job in the summer of going into that uh, Christine and her team into that study without uh, an, an invasion of the police department. You know, I mean. Um, so it's it's I think there's a the, the fundamental issue here is that um, we want to collect data and we want to analyze, but we don't want to get into management of the departments or the committees or boards. Anybody that is um, you know interacting with a department, um, even if you see something that's doesn't look right, right? You know, this is the idea is you, if, if it has a cost to it and it's a cost that we don't need, I think I think we all know enough to bring that back to the finance committee, but we don't try to tell the department manager or the people in the staff uh, what they should be doing or how they should be, do it, be doing it. That's entirely the prerogative of the professional management in the town. Did I hear? Somebody say something? 
Sorry, Charlie. I think I was talking and I'm not muted. Oh, okay. Sorry, That's all right. Myself. <laughs> I just I just want to make sure that if someone has something to say that I recognize them. No, yes. Sorry. John. Uh, which precincts are we missing? How many are we missing? Uh, there are three. It's four. 18. Do you remember the other precinct, Liz? Um, I think it's precinct one, Charlie. What? No, John Ellis is from precinct one, I think, right, John? No, I'm three. I'm oh, you're three. three. I don't see anybody from two. I'm looking Grant at is, Grant is precinct one. Uh, Shane, Shane is from two. I don't have the list in front of you. Four and 18 are two that come to mind. I can't remember the third one. It's one. It's one? Okay, so one, four, and eighteen. No, no, it's not one. Well, maybe it is one. Maybe I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm assigned to a different one this year. It you're, is yeah, well, one, you're, four, and eighteen. One, four, and eighteen. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, well, anybody has any comments or questions or thoughts about any of this? F please feel free to uh, pulse me uh in you know in in the future and don't feel that you have to do this that, that you have to be on one of these working groups if, you, if you're already fully engaged and you know have a busy schedule that's fine too i'm just trying to create an environment where we can get some more things done and that more people can have an impact on the directions that we move in the future so um I guess the, the most important question before we open ourselves up for a uh, motion to adjourn is um, how are we doing on budgets? So, so I can mention a bit about our own. Um, so next week we have calls planned for our finance, some of the finance subcommittee budgets. Um, so I think in the next week and a half or so, we should have some areas of the finance subcommittee budget taken care of. Um, what let, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for Al to speak. Al, I'm sorry, maybe I took your thunder or you're the leader of the group, so you should speak probably, but I just jumped in. So. Al, did you want to say anything? No, we're, you know, we're cranking along, uh, speaking to budgets, but we don't have any budgets to present in the next two meetings, Wednesday or Monday. Okay. Uh, Dave, you and Peter normally crank out the uh, general government budget in the first hour of our <laughs> new existence. How, what do you think uh, the schedule is? Well, uh, I have to get a, get with Peter, and we have to figure out a plan on, on what action we're going to take. But um, once we do that, we'll be coming to you. But it will be probably take another week or so to put that together. Okay, so um, maybe uh, let's let's say that we'll postpone Wednesday's meeting and Monday's meeting, and have. Um, the next meeting a week from Wednesday. Is that, does that give everybody an, enough time to get started on budgets? That's great. I think so. Liz, do we have any hearings? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna, that's what I just wanted to bring up. I'm looking at the calendar now. <laughs> Uh, the next one is on February 22nd with the arts culture. Okay, so then we'll, let's say then that the the, the next finance committee meeting will be Wednesday. The next finance committee meeting will be what? I didn't hear what you said. So the next finance committee meeting will be Wednesday, February 10th. Okay, thanks. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. So uh, before we uh, 
uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, I want to thank everybody for you know all the effort people put in so far this year and in the first half of uh, the last half of 2020. And um, I just want to make sure that you all drive carefully going home, going home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Very snowy out there. <laughs> hey Charlie, I have a I have a request. Um, the presentation that you just made. Um, I don't have it in my email, so I don't know if you had sent that or not. Well, I, I think we did send it out, but guess what? I was successful tonight in putting it on SharePoint. There's, oh, a, folder, SharePoint. there's a folder there that says chair documents, and it's in there. I, I, and I did it I did it without calling Annie or, or Alan or George. Uh, I, I, I guess the only thing I would say is that if somebody puts a new document on SharePoint, I guess I have to turn on a notification of some sort and I'll figure out how to do that. Yeah, that would probably be a good idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just for everybody's knowledge, I'm starting now to use the new um, email program. So I won't be sending anything to the town email, but I'll be using the Microsoft program, which will automatically forward it to your town address. But I did send out that document. So it concerns me, Arif, that you didn't see it. Okay, I'll check All again. Right. But, uh, just double check, just to make sure. I, I didn't see it either, Liz. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna look into why that wouldn't be there. I'll, 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 I'll send it to everybody as well. Yeah. How long ago did you send it? I sent it this afternoon. Oh, no, then no. So you went into Microsoft yep. email? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. I thought I thought it was automatically forwarding to our personal emails list. Yeah, it is. Everything should be, yep. Liz, so maybe I can send help you out with that, I think. Jonathan, try sending to your town.arlington.mod.us address and it should be forwarded to your personal address. And if you send to your Arlington FinCom dot online address, it should go to your town address and then to your personal address. If that's not working, let me know. Okay. <laughs> and okay. email me if you did. Well, which address uh, well, should I get? Email you. Email you. Follow up with that. We'll, we'll <laughs> talk about that. See, see how that's working. Okay. Any other? Um, anybody have any other business or questions they want to bring up tonight? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Yeah. We're yeah. adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.